Hi, so in this video I want to go through my current number one favorite proof in computational complexity theory, the proof for IP equals P space. In case you've never heard of this theorem before, well, I can't blame you, I personally haven't seen IP equals P space much in the press either, but that's exactly why I'm here, because this is definitely a Hall of Fame result. It embodies everything that's awesome about computer science. And what I want to start with is an intriguing little introductory story that originated with Stephen Ruddick. It's called The Tale of the Chess Master, and it goes something like this. One fine day, a mysterious old man with a white flowing beard appears in town. He goes to the town park, silently sets up a chessboard, seats himself behind white, and then declares to the people around him, anybody want to try and beat an old geezer at chess? I bet any of you a gold coin that I'll have you checkmated within 300 moves. My only condition is that I play as white. Some brief chatter breaks out until a moment later a challenger emerges which the old man proceeds to swiftly trance. Next announces the man. And so another person faces him. The result is still the same. One after the other he beats every opponent to come forward, always solidly within the 300 turn limit. The day has already progressed well into the afternoon and a small ring of people has by now gathered around the old man and his chessboard. Suddenly the crowd parts as people bow to an impressively armored man approaching the board. Merlin, long time no see, exclaims the man. King Arthur, replies Merlin, what brings you to the park? I heard you arrived this morning already and was curious what kept you. I see you've come up with another scheme to make money of the poor people of Camelot, says Arthur. It's just chess, replies Merlin. There's complete information. I couldn't cheat if I tried. And yet you've apparently been winning all day, Arthur points out. Ah, but that's just because I found a winning strategy for chess. You did? asks Arthur incredulously. Do you mind showing me? Well, technically speaking, I could, but it would require going through all possible games of chess, pointing out that for every move black could make, white has an appropriate response, says Merlin. But that would take eons. How could you possibly execute such a strategy? Um, I might use a few tricks, Merlin answers. So you're cheating after all, Arthur calls out. Okay, maybe a little, Merlin admits. You probably don't even have a winning strategy, says Arthur. You're just saying that because it sounds more impressive. Oh, about this you're mistaken, my king. I definitely have such a strategy, and this I can prove. All right, so that's the intro for IP equals P space. This theorem establishes that everything that can be proven with an interactive proof, IP, can also be computed with polynomial memory, or space, hence the name P space. And more importantly for our two protagonists, it also establishes the reverse. Everything that can be computed with a polynomial amount of memory can also be proven with an interactive proof. This might not sound like much at first, so to really drive the point home, let me restate this one more time in the most grandiose way that I can. IP equals P space means that a brief conversation with God could teach you something that you could never learn from the Bible, even if the Bible was the size of the observable universe. For instance, it's possible to learn whether white has a winning strategy for chess. Now, this might not be the first thing that would come to mind if one had the chance to talk to God. I personally would probably first ask about his favorite programming language. Unfortunately, if we want to actually prove anything here, we'll have to stick to mathematically precise questions. Okay, before we get started, there are two points here that I want to clarify. First point, in what sense does chess require polynomial space? Polynomial space is an asymptotic statement, and on the face of it, it may appear like the question whether white has a winning strategy has nothing at all to do with asymptotics. It's just a single yes or no question. That's true. Problem is, we mathematicians just don't yet have a good theoretical framework for the difficulty of one-off questions like these. We only really understand how to categorize whole infinite families of questions. So, just like good politicians, we won't answer the question that was actually asked. We'll instead answer the question we wish we had been asked. 
Specifically, we will think of chess as a more general problem that is played on an n by n board, not just on an 8 by 8 board. The exact way one generalizes the rules of the game for n by n isn't too important here, but what is important is that the game stays in p space. For this, we only need to restrict the duration of our games to some reasonable constant, say 300 moves. And if we do that, then we can simply use a basic backtracking algorithm to go through all possible lines of play, length less than 300, and make sure that white can force a checkmate every single time. The memory requirements for this algorithm are just a constant number of polynomial size chess configurations. That's a polynomial amount, so we're good. Finally, and here's the crucial point that makes this more than just intellectual masturbation. Once we found an interactive proof protocol for our pi in the sky n by n chess, 8 by 8 will be a mere special case, for which we'll then arrive at a completely practical solution. That's the first point. Second point, what exactly is an interactive proof or an interactive proof protocol anyway? An interactive proof is a proof where, as the name suggests, the prover, Merlin, and verifier, Arthur, interact. This contrasts with how mathematical claims are usually proven. By default, one mathematician spends untold hours coming up with a proof, compresses it beyond recognition, and then shows it to other mathematicians who carefully read the proof and either accept or reject it. On special occasions, such as in the case of the ABC conjecture, they might do both. What they don't do is to discuss back and forth. Again, the ABC conjecture is a case in point. Perhaps I'm oversimplifying a little here, but you get what I'm saying. A standard mathematical proof is essentially a lecture. An interactive proof, on the other hand, is more like a game. Arthur and Merlin take turns, and Merlin establishes his claim by winning the game. This already sounds a lot like chess. The problem is, if Arthur and Merlin just play chess, Arthur can only be convinced by Merlin's claim if he plays optimally. That's too hard. What we want instead is a game in which Arthur can participate using only a reasonable, specifically a polynomial amount of time. In order to pull this off, Merlin and Arthur will have to play a different mathematical kind of game that's built from chess. In this new game, Arthur no longer needs to play optimally. In fact, he can just play randomly. Yet, remarkably, in this new kind of game, if it's possible for Arthur to win at all, he'll have a very good chance to win by just simulating the proverbial chimp. As a consequence, if Merlin beats Arthur just a few times at this new game, Arthur can be virtually certain that Merlin indeed has a winning strategy for this game and therefore also for chess. Note that Arthur won't achieve full certainty the way he could with traditional proofs. He can only achieve 99.999 whatever percent certainty. That's just something we'll have to live with. In the immortal words of Gawa, no risk, no fun. With all that in mind, let me finally actually give a definition of IP, which is that um, IP is the set of problems such that A is in IP if there exists an Arthur Merlin game bounded by a polynomial number of turns such that uh, Merlin can always win if uh, his claim is true. So that's if A of X is true. And Arthur can win with probability two thirds if x equals false. Also, Arthur has the ability to flip coins if he likes to, and he's assumed to be bounded by a polynomial time. Merlin, on the other hand, is computationally unbounded. There are also equivalent definitions in which Merlin only has to win two-thirds of the time. Similarly, Arthur's winning percentage is somewhat arbitrary since it can always be amplified by repeating the game a number of times. 
Also, I'd like to mention that Arthur and Merlin are actually official protagonists in the literature. They were introduced in the mid-80s by Laszlo Babay, so I'm not just fooling around here. Uh, of course, some people will prefer more neutral terms such as prover and verifier. For my part, I'll just be praying that these poor souls get back in touch with their inner child. All right, let's get on with the proof then. First, let's prove that IP is contained in PSpace. This direction. For that, we can just use the backtracking algorithm again that we already used to put chess in PSpace. We simply go through all possible sequences of moves, check that Merlin has a win no matter what. And because a game only has a polynomial number of turns, this only consumes a polynomial amount of memory. And so we're done. That's already it. Trademark. Unfortunately, as you may be able to gather from the time remaining on this video, the other direction, the direction we really actually care about, isn't quite that easy. Now we need to prove that P space is contained in IP. In other words, we need to turn any problem in P space into an Arthur Merlin game. Where do we even start here? There is an untold variety of problems in P space. You have to perform a construction that works for all of them. It sounds like a tall order. Actually, it's not nearly so bad. The way we'll tame this zoo is by converting all possible P space problems into a single problem that's P space complete namely Quantified Satisfiability, or QSAT, alternatively known as Quantified Boolean Formula, or QBF. What's that I hear you say, QSAT? Let's just look at an example. Examples, in my opinion, almost always beat definitions, when you're new to something at least. For all x, x is the y, that for all z not x not y or not z or x or and x or y or z. Right. If you recall the problem called SAT from the NP context, this is very similar to that, except in SAT all the variables were implicitly quantified with the exists quantifier, referring to this stuff out front here. In QSAT, on the other hand, we allowed both types of quantifiers, and we can alternate them. Actually, while I'm on the topic of quantifiers, allow me a brief digression, which I think will pay off later. The thing is, when I look back at how I was first taught quantifiers, they were always taught by the teacher saying, for all x there exists a y such that for all z, as if emphasizing the words somehow added clarity. With hindsight, I think that was a terrible way to explain them. The way I think of quantifiers now, in which I prefer by miles, is as turns in a game. My opponent picks the values for the for all quantifiers, I pick the values for the exist quantifiers, the order of the quantifiers determines the sequence in which we take turns, and once we get to the end of the quantifiers, we plug in all the values and see if the expression at the center is true or false. If it's true, I win, otherwise my opponent wins. And the truth or falsehood of the entire expression is equivalent to whether or not I have a winning strategy in this game. Here's an example. Let's say my opponent picks x equals true as his first move, then I pick y equals false, and my opponent doesn't really matter at this point, he might pick the z equals true again. So he picked x equals true, that makes this clause true. I picked y equals false, so that makes this clause true. And then together, it's true. So I have won this particular game. And it's easy to see that actually there's a winning strategy for me here. I can just pick whatever is the opposite of my opponent's pick for x. 
and that guarantees victory for me. So this entire Boolean formula is true. And the same works in other contexts, such as the infamous delta epsilon definition of continuity. First, my opponent picks an epsilon, then I pick a delta, finally my opponent picks x and y. We then check whether either x and y are more than delta apart, if that's the case I win by a technical foul, or we check if f of x and f of y are within epsilon, in which case I've met my opponent's challenge. And if I can always win, then the function is continuous. I personally find this much, much clearer than the usual approach. In fact, when teaching continuity, many teachers won't even realize that it's actually the quantifiers that are causing all the trouble. They bl blame the Greek letters instead. For example, I recall a story from the book Mathematical Apocrypha by Stephen Kranz, where a math, a math department got so desperate that they forbid the use of deltas and epsilons in the coming semester. So one professor simply switched to sigmas and taus instead. Further, if you don't have the concept of a game in your mind, it's easy to get confused about which variables can depend on which other variables. One of my own professors even went so far as to explicitly annotate the quantifiers like so. He would write, for all epsilon exists, a delta as a function of epsilon dot dot dot. But if you think of it as a game, then it's just bloody obvious that decisions for later turns depend on decisions for early turns. Could you even imagine playing chess without making your moves depend on earlier moves, either your opponent's or your own? Finally, the game vantage point exploits your brain's natural tendency to think in terms of agents. Millions of years of evolution have trained us to think in terms of Og want this, Og want that, how do Og get what he wants? So this whole approach is just psychologically easier. Right. End of digression. I want to move on. So we've just seen an example of QSAT and you can probably already imagine what other examples might look like. The only noteworthy restriction is that every variable needs to be bound by the quantifiers so that the whole formula has a definite true or false status. I now claim that any problem in p-space can be reduced to QSAT. More precisely, given any instance of a problem in p-space, it's possible, using polynomial time, to convert it into a polynomial size QSAT formula, such that this QSAT formula is true if and only if the original instance was a yes instance. Specifically, this means that Arthur can just turn the 8x8 chessboard into a QSAT formula and then Merlin can convince Arthur about the truth of the QSAT formula instead. The full details for why QSAT is p-space complete are somewhat tedious, but let me at least outline the reasoning. First, we can think of any p-space computation as simply checking which state, true or false, is reachable from the initial state of the program. In other words, an input x is accepted if and only if there exists a path from its initial state to the final state t in the computation graph. Here's a picture for you to look at. Let's put x up here, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, it, and let's put true here. The full graph is actually a little larger than what I've drawn here. These are just the vertices that are on the path that are relevant to us. We could turn this also in the, to the following claim. There exists a P, which stands for path, such that reach a bull x t. So this is a predicate, x and t are kind of hard-coded into it, and it takes p as its only real parameter, and it checks whether p connects x to t. That's not yet a Boolean formula, though. But never mind that, Cook Levin to the rescue. The Cook Levin theorem, as you may or may not recall, establishes the NP-completeness of FreeSat 
by turning an arbitrary polynomial time verification algorithm into a polynomial size free set formula. And the same construction can also be applied to our reachable predicate. In case you're out of the loop on how to prove the Cook Levin theorem, here's the 30 second Cliff's Notes version. We take our polynomial time verification algorithm and unroll all the loops by just copy pasting the loop bodies over and over together with the appropriate branching logic. We know that the whole program runs in polynomial time. So this only requires a polynomial amount of copy pasting. We now have an absolutely hideous polynomial size program, referring to the size of the source code here, that simply runs top to bottom without ever jumping back up. We then turn this program line by line into Boolean circuitry using AND, OR and NOT gates, each line taking its input from the line above and passing it to the line below. That gives us a polynomial size Boolean circuit. Finally, we take this circuit and create a handful of reset clauses for each gate, mirroring their behavior. And all these clauses together and voila! We have a polynomial size Freeset formula that's satisfiable if and only if there exists an input that the original verification algorithm would have accepted. Unfortunately, there is one tiny little footnote in this whole construction. Not only is it required that the verification algorithm we are starting with runs in polynomial time, this we can actually vouch for. It's also required that its input is only of polynomial size. And that's not the case with the pass we're checking here. So if we just blindly threw Cook Levin at our reachable predicate, we'd end up with an exponential size formula. The way around this obstacle, and at this point, this will probably no longer shock you, is that we'll play a game instead, the reachability game. Let's walk through a small example with our two protagonists as the players. Suppose Merlin begins with saying, this vertex X connects to this vertex T, and it goes through this midpoint the path. After my doubt this claim and say, well, then there must be a path from here to here, right? Indeed, says Merlin, and it goes through this midpoint. Now Arthur again chooses left or right and says, well then, uh, show to me that there's a path from here to here. Sure, says Merlin, it goes through this midpoint. Well, then there must be a path from here to here, right? Says Arthur. Oh, blimey, they are indeed adjacent. And that establishes Merlin's claim. It's not too hard to see that if there really is a path connecting the two endpoints, Merlin will be able to answer all of Arthur's challenges. Conversely, if there's no such path, then Arthur will be able to keep the focus on a gap so that Merlin can never lead Arthur to two adjacent vertices. All that's left to do then is to add a turn limit to the game so that unless Merlin manages to close the gap within this turn limit, Arthur wins by default. However, this turn limit still needs to be big enough to always allow Merlin to win if indeed there is a path. And how big is that? That's the crucial point. Since Merlin can chop down the length of the remaining sections by half on each of his turns, it only needs to be logarithmic in the size of the exponentially long path. And that's polynomial. Finally, all this talk about a turn-based game should ring a bell. That's right, we can turn all of this into a quantified expression like so. All midpoint zero exists at bisection zero. This keeps going in alternating fashion. And then at the very center, we again have a predicate, which I call our game, again, depending on our endpoints, which now takes all these variables. And so our game's job here is to actually determine the winner of the game based on the moves that they made. 
Also, we can make all our variables range over booleans only while keeping the quantifier strictly alternating by throwing in some dummy variables that do nothing. Now, there are polynomially many quantifiers out front. Furthermore, because our game only receives input of polynomial size, this time we can convert it into a Boolean formula of only polynomial size. So this entire formula, once converted, is only of polynomial size, meaning Arthur can actually construct this formula. And it will be true if and only if the original x was a yes instance. Okay, we now have every possible problem in PSpace, including chess, in the form of a quantified Boolean formula. And we've already seen that these formulas can be viewed as describing a game. So is this the game we're looking for? Can Arthur just play QSAT with Merlin, tossing coins for his variables? No, that would be too easy, wouldn't it? Instead, what we'll have to do next is carry out an extremely profound transformation of our formula called arithmetization, which allows us to turn Boolean formulas into regular algebraic expressions. In a way, this is exactly the bridge between regular and Boolean algebra that George Boole himself got so excited about in the mid-19th century. But it got a lot of renewed enthusiasm starting in the late 80s and early 90s because it is an example of a so-called non-relativizing proof technique. This basically means that it passes a very high theoretical barrier towards a proof of p not equal np. It still wasn't enough to get there, otherwise it would have helped by now, but nonetheless it paves the way for a number of important results, in particular the result we're proving right now. How does it work? It's actually very simple. Let's start with the following observation. If we write out the truth table of the AND function, what we'll see is something like this. It's AND holds true, holds true, and kind of everything is false except this. This already looks a lot like multiplication. If you squint a little and you pretend like f is 0 and true is 1, then actually there's really no difference. You're just using different symbols. Similarly, if you look at not, you get this, which is exactly, well, this doesn't really have a name, but nonetheless it's a function. This accomplishes. This is the mapping arrow. So we already have ways to map Boolean algebra exactly onto regular algebra, as long as we restrict ourselves to zeros and ones. The last one in the trio, though, is a little bothersome. So here's or. And here, unfortunately, it's not quite that successful because here, if we just map false to zero and true to one, then one plus one isn't equal to one again. But there's an easy fix for that. And that fix is De Morgan's law. De Morgan's law gets rid of all of our ors and leaves us only with ands and nots. And those we know how to handle. Finally, for all quantifiers are basically just big ands that set the bound variable once to false and once to true. Similarly, exists quantifiers are big ors. And that covers everything. All right, I think we need an example here. So let's just go again through the one that we had earlier. Let me write it back down, fold x, this the y, fold z. This one. So before we get started, remember that we need to get rid of all of our ors, meaning the morgans. As a brief side note though, let me add, when I first learned the morgans law, I personally had a lot of trouble applying it. I'd see something like 
this and I would go through all kinds of mental gymnastics trying to apply the rule exactly as I learned it. But what I eventually found out is that it's much simpler than that. It's really just, you can remember De Morgan's law as flip everything. So here you flip the negation on the x, you flip the and to the or and the or to the end. So this becomes that. Flip the thing above the y and you flip the negation on the entire clause. And so there you go. I simply flipped everything and that's De Morgan's law. So let's apply that here. X, no, flip everything. This and we like, we like our ends. And I shouldn't forget, we need to flip also the negation on the entire clauses. Now we're ready for arithmetization proper. So just remember, and becomes multiplication and not becomes one minus whatever was knotted. So this here becomes one minus x, y, z. So this negation here becomes this one minus and this and of three terms here becomes this product and that multiplies. So now I'm taking care of this and this thing. That's one minus and all of these are knotted. So it's one minus X minus Y. Ooh. Can I fit that in there? All right. So now we have arithmetized the center of the formula and now we move outwards. Next stage, the for all quantifier. Remember, uh, for all means plug in zero and one and multiply each of the results. If I plug in a zero here, I get well, just one that disappears in the multiplication. If I plug in zero here, this becomes a one and all I'm left with is really this stuff from the second parenthesis. Right, now I also need to plug in one. Uh, when I plug in one, it's this uh, latter parenthesis that disappears because this becomes a zero, kills everything here. It's is the only thing remaining and that disappears in the multiplication. So it's just one minus x, y. Next stop, the exists quantifier. Let me do that over here. So let's just do that without going through the moment separately. So we get one minus, one minus and stuff. This is kind of the skeleton of De Morgan's uh, and arithmetization at once. And into these two boxes, we fill in what we get if we plug in y equals zero and y equals one. Plug in y equals zero here. Uh, it's this, this back part that disappears and we are left with one minus one minus x. and plug in y, y equals one, and now all this out front disappears, and all we're left, is, left with is one minus x. And finally, we take care of the for all. So that means, well, actually, let's simplify this first, because one minus and one minus is kind of like double negation, which you can cancel. So here we get, these two one minuses cancel, right? And back here, these two one minuses also cancel. So it's already a lot clearer. Now we do the final arithmetization. Plug in zero here. Oh, I think we get one. If 
for the entire thing and plug in one and I think we also get one. Multiply the two results and bingo. So this now says that the entire thing originally expressed a true quantified Boolean formula, which is what we had already found out before. So order in the universe is retained. Now, first question that should immediately come to mind is, couldn't alpha simply do what we just did and use this to solve QSAT all by himself? That would be pretty neat, wouldn't it? It would make P equal to P space, even better than P equal to NP. Rivers would start flowing with milk and honey if we could pull this off. So needless to say, this will not work. The fly in the ointment is that every time we eliminate the quantifier, we multiply together two copies of the inner formula, once for zero and once for one. We only got lucky with our example here, but in general, this leads to a doubling of the size of the expression for every quantifier we convert. So after we've converted a polynomial number of them, we'll have an exponential size expression on our hands and we are toast. But that's why Merlin is here. A wizard with infinite computational power ought to be useful somehow, right? This is where our game finally starts to take shape. Here's an initial sketch of the idea. Merlin begins by arithmetizing and simplifying the entire formula and then claims that the result is one. Arthur naturally does this claim. So in order to reassure Arthur, Merlin also dictates to him the arithmetization of everything following the first quantifier. So everything up to this point, he arithmetizes everything here. In essence, he gives uh, Arthur this then. Using this, Arthur can then perform the last step in the arithmetization himself and verify that Merlin's claim about the whole formula is correct. So far, so good. Except Arthur now still needs to check this inner arithmetization. And how does he do that? By recursing, of course. Arthur and Merlin just keep going in this fashion. For each quantifier, Merlin arithmetizes the body of the quantifier. Then Arthur uses that to double check Merlin's claims from, from the previous round. Eventually, they hit the center of the formula, which Arthur can arithmetize all by himself. And we're done. Or are we? Spoiler, we are not. And some of you might have already suspected we're not for the following reason. There was nothing in the game I've just laid out which one couldn't simply convert into a straightforward recursive algorithm. And because there was no checking of multiple cases each turn, this algorithm would run in polynomial time. So Merlin again would have become redundant, which is simply too good to be true. So there must be a flaw here somewhere. In fact, there are two flaws. Flaw number one. First, Merlin claims that the entire expression simplifies to one. At the second stage, Merlin claims that it is equal to this thing here. At the third stage, he claims an arithmetization, which is this. And in general, after n stages, he has an expression on his hand, which has n free variables. So once they've made their way halfway through all the quantifiers, they have a polynomial number of free variables on their hand, and the expression that Merlin might have to communicate to Arthur could be something like this. So z plus x, y plus c plus y, c, x plus y plus z. Which, as you may see, is proportional to the power set of the three variables. And that's just too much for Arthur. Floor number two. Even if we are at the very start, where there's only very few free variables, one is already enough, it's still possible that through all the doubling that goes on during arithmetization, we end up with a univariate polynomial that looks not as harmless as this thing, but like this. But this might actually happen in the worst case. And as you can see, there is a lot of terms in this thing. So again, Arthur would be dead in the water. 
These are the two final hurdles we need to clear. Okay, let's just start with the second problem because this one has a relatively simple fix. This fix was actually not part of the original proof, but is a simplification due to Alexander Shen. It's based on the simple observation that since we're ultimately going to set every variable to either zero or one, we are free to replace x to the two to the 50th with just x. After all, on the values zero and one, these are identical. The way we work this into our protocol is by adding a new type of quantifier, the reduce quantifier, and we sprinkle this into our formula like so. Uh, this might become a little longer, so bear with me. And this is the one I'm talking about, the backwards R. Okay, you may notice that the number of additional quantifiers follows the triangle numbers. So this is only a polynomial amount of overhead. From the perspective of Boolean logic, these quantifiers do absolutely nothing. They don't even bind their variables. It's only when one arithmetizes the formula that they have any effect. Namely, they have the effect of setting all the exponents of their variable back to one. They linearize along the variable. The consequence of this for the game is that after each time we potentially double the degrees by arithmetizing a proper quantifier, we reset all the exponents, which keeps them small and manageable. Arthur could do this all by himself, or Merlin can do it, and then Arthur checks him. For the sake of consistency, we'll follow the latter convention. That takes care of the second problem. Now for the first problem, and this is the big one. This is where finally Merlin becomes indispensable. The key concept that we need is this. Let's say we have two polynomials, such as x squared minus one and x plus one, x minus one. And we want to check that they're equal. Obviously these are equal, but how could we figure this out in general? Well, generally you might say just fully multiply both of them out, group and sort the terms, and then check that everything matches. That's one way of doing it. Here's another way. We can plug in a random value into both of them. If the polynomials are indeed identical, we'll always get the same answer. But if not, then they can only agree on a very small number of points. See this, take the above example and turn this into this, which is really not even worth mentioning, just to make it clear. By the fundamental theorem of algebra, unless this is the zero polynomial, in which case they are identical, this can have at most a number of solutions equal to the degree of this polynomial. So if we just pick a random value from a large enough set, we can be almost certain that this test gives the right answer. Okay, that's neat, but what can Arthur do with this? Here's what. Instead of asking Merlin to provide complete proof that he's provided the correct arithmetization of the inner formula, Arthur instead asks only for proof that the inner polynomial is equal to some expected value at a certain point. This is almost as good for Arthur's purposes, but crucially, this keeps the number of free variables down. Because each time a variable becomes free as we move inward, Arthur then promptly sets it to some random value before continuing. 
All that's left to do then is to briefly unset these values anytime Arthur needs to verify a linearization step. And that's it. All right, that's all well and good, but a number of you are probably still a little confused. So before concluding, I want to go through one final example of this whole procedure. And for this, I have written a little program, which is in closure. which I expect to be God's favorite programming language. And here you can see I've called this formula phi. This is the same formula that's been following us throughout. So not entirely coincidental. This is in prefix notation because closure is a lisp. It's the and of these two clauses. So usually this would be the wedge in between here. This is the OR of the three normal literals. This is the OR of the three negated literals. And here is Merlin's claim. So Merlin claims that this entire thing, if you arithmetize it, is one, which we've already seen, but let's see how we could also see this in an interactive proof. So as a proof, Merlin also offers us this. This is to back up this claim. And here's the verdict that our little electronic alpha would have returned. He believes this. So if you plug in zero here and you plug in one, uh, plug in zero, you get one minus zero plus zero, that's one. Plug in one, you get one minus one plus one, that's one. Multiply them together, you indeed get one. The reason you multiply them, right, is because this is a for all quantifier the x. So this proof indeed establishes this claim. And now we move on to the next stage, because now we need to double check this proof, right? Uh, but before we can do that, x needs an assignment, because x is now free, and we don't want our free variables to pile up. So let's go to a random number generator. And I think this should be enough for our purposes. And it tells us free. So now we have substituted x equals free. And if you put free into this, you get one minus three is minus two plus nine is seven. And that's the claim for the next term. So now Merlin needs to back up the claim that this thing, if you plug in three, is seven, which is equivalent to the claim that this here arithmetizes to seven. And for that, he has this proof. So now you plug in y equals zero and one into this, and you do the arithmetic uh, De Morgan dance, and you should come out with seven again. At least that's what our computer has done. And then we move on to the next stage. Now we need a Y. Give me another number. I plug in one into this. You should come up with this. Let's double check that at least. That's negative 11 plus three. It's negative eight plus six. That's uh, negative two. And now this is the proof, right? I think we can get from here to here, from going from here to here with the, the Morgan in between is a little tedious, but let's do this part. So now we plug in zero and one in here, plug in zero, you get one, plug in one, you get minus two. So one times minus two indeed is minus two. And finally, we need a Z. Now, plug in two in here, you should get this. And this here, Merlin no longer needs to prove. He just provides no proof, because now Arthur can just arithmetize all of this himself, plug in these values, 
and he should get minus five and that should double check this. So that's one run through the entire protocol. Also, let's take a brief visit to how this looks with reductions in between. So here we have a whole bunch of R's right here and here, and here's another one. Let's pick the same one, the same number, shall we? Let me just plug them in. And let's just check here. Let's check if this indeed establishes this. Because here, so this is one thing we haven't seen before. Here we're doing a reduction, right? So here what we're doing is we should linearize this, meaning drop the two here. Then this negative 11 and the six, they merge, become a negative five y plus three. And then you plug in zero and one. Oh no, you just plug in these values straight up because we already assigned y earlier. So x doesn't appear here, just plug in y, you get three minus five, right? Because if plug in y equals one, that's negative two. So that's how you would double check a reduction quantifier. And that's the entire protocol. So I'll just leave it here. In case you want to actually check on this, uh, that's also possible. So the code is here, specifically in this namespace. And well, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here, as you can see. What we did just now was interact manually. There's also other stuff, for instance, there's just plain interact where you throw in your test integers up front without getting queried one after the other. Uh, here's arithmetize, so this is the arithmetization logic together with a few helper functions here. There's simplify, this does all the multiplying everything out, gathering terms, whatnot. So that calls a whole bunch of helper logic here. That's actually not quite trivial. And yeah, so if you ever do make it to heaven, make sure to bring a calculator.